Hello, we're going to be talking about the axial age. This video follows uh, the video on primal to archaic transition, which follows the video on the religion timeline. So you should be watching them in that order to make the most sense out of them. There is also a document um, online that, uh, uh, assuming you're one of the students that's watching this, that is called the Axial Age Notes. And uh, you want to read that first. It's a, a pretty good description of the Axial Age. And having read that, I will not have to elaborate quite as much. So this will probably not be as long of a video. Anyway, um, let me put myself in the corner over here. Um, just a simple slide here. But again, you have a document that I want you to read uh, before you start this. Um, as we mentioned, the Axial Age, generally we're looking at a, a date of about 800 to 200 uh, BCE. And of course, uh, you read about the scholar that coined this term uh, in your Axial Age notes. And uh, so 800 to 200 is, uh, again, just a, kind of an estimate. But in this 600-year period, um, all over the world, in the most advanced civilizations, we see uh, a major change. It's almost like uh, human beings are taking some kind of evolutionary leap in the way they philosophically think about uh, ultimate reality, um, ultimate power. Um, and so the first aspect here I want to talk about is the transcendental aspect. To transcend something means to go beyond. And when we say transcendental, uh, in this case, um, we're talking about the fact that the ultimate reality or the ultimate truth or the ultimate power, God, if you will, um, is seen as being beyond the universe. Um, and this is when we say cosmological, of course, cosmos is the universe. So cosmological means uh, having to do with the universe. And in religious studies, when we say cosmological ideas or cosmological rituals, it means that people are finding, finding significance in the cycles of the universe and using them to represent some kind of a, uh, uh, a sacred significance. Transcendental, we're talking about here going beyond uh, the universe, beyond the natural world, beyond what is conceivable um, by humans. So when we say that the ultimate is beyond the universe, we're not just saying locationally, but we were saying that uh, beyond this world, uh, where we find the limits of space and time, um, these things don't apply. And, um, and also, uh, we're talking about something that we can't conceive of or imagine simply because we do have these limitations. We think in space and time. So the Axial Age is a period, in a sense, where um, people start thinking about the limits of their perception, the limits of their understanding, and um, and for the first time assume that there is something beyond that. Now when I say people, I'm obviously talking about the philosophers, the theologians, the deep thinkers, obviously um, you know the average person who's out uh, tilling their field or whatever might not be uh, uh, wrestling with these higher concepts, but they do end up defining um, uh, the major religion's ideas of what the ultimate is as something beyond the universe, beyond space and time, beyond human comprehension. Um, there's an interesting um, saying I came up with that's so redundant, it's, it's, it's uh, annoying, but it kind of gets the point across. And that is that the axial age is the time when humans start thinking about the fact that they're thinking about things that they can't even think about, which leads them to think that they probably exist. Let's unpack that. <laughs> they're thinking about things. That is, they're recognizing the reality that they are thinking or trying to think about things they've never thought about before. And they're finding, this is the third thing here, they're finding themselves unable uh, to actually go beyond this barrier in their understanding. and um, But that leads them uh, to the conclusion that there must be something beyond it. There must be something there. And um, so, again, thinking about things they can't even think about, which leads them to think uh, that they probably exist. So it's kind of like if, if the universe ended uh, with a wall, kind of like uh, the wall next to me, you know, and, uh, and somebody just ran into the wall and couldn't go any farther, they would say, oh, that's the end of the universe. I guess that's it. 
until the axial age. The axial age is when people run into the wall and go, oh no, you know, I can't go through the wall, but I know there's something on the other side that I can't get to. I wonder what it is. Why did this happen when it did? And in so many different advanced civilizations all over the world, um, it's a big mystery. And um, something, of course, that fascinated uh, many different um, scholars, uh, especially uh, Carl Jaspers, who <coughs> uh, in the uh, uh, Axial Age document that you read, uh, is the one who actually coined the term. It's actually German uh, term. So translated into English, it's usually Axial Age, but sometimes you might see it as Axis Age because the word can be translated different ways. Um, so that's the first thing. Um, now, before uh, the Axial Age, uh, certainly uh, the gods were uh, <clears throat> thought to be higher than humans, uh, certainly with lots of powers other than humans, but still kind of thought of as being like humans. And um, the important thing is that the gods exist in this universe. I mean, you might hike up to the top of Mount Olympus and, uh, and not find anything up there, but you would just assume that you weren't worthy, so the gods hid themselves from you. Um, but you still think that they exist in this universe. You still think that this universe is the ultimate reality. Before the Axial Age, there's nothing that leads people to think that uh, what they're experiencing in this world is not the ultimate reality. There's nothing that leads them to believe that there is some alternate reality uh, beyond all of the constraints of our thinking. That's the kind of thing that starts happening um, in the Axial Age. So, again, before the Axial Age, uh, you know, you can look up and see the sun, and maybe you believe that Helios is up there pushing the sun across the sky. And clearly, you can't go up and hang with Helios as he's pushing the sun across the sky. But the fact of the matter is, you're looking at the sun. The sun is in this universe. It's a part of this universe. Um, so, uh, I, again, uh, no problem believing in gods that are elusive or that maybe are hard to understand. But it's in the Axial Age where we begin... Uh, to think of a reality beyond the universe, beyond space and time, beyond human comprehension. Now, the second category here, supernatural, really is kind of the flip side of the same coin. When we say supernatural, I'm not using it in the way that you might use it with Superman, you know, faster than a speeding bullet or whatever. But super means above and natural. We're talking about the natural world. Before the Axial Age, um, Obviously, we're focused on connecting with something in this universe that we recognize as the power of the universe. And while that isn't necessarily wiped out, the idea is that when we're involved in some kind of worship or some kind of petition or something like that, we are trying to connect to something beyond the universe. Once, once we get to the axial age, that is, we're trying to connect to something beyond the universe. And, um, and, and yes, we obviously are trapped in this natural world, and so we are certainly trying to find some way, uh, being in this natural world, to connect with that which transcends the natural world. So when we say supernatural, we mean beyond the natural world or order. <clears throat> now, it gets really interesting in the third uh, area here, well, as if it wasn't interesting already, um, but in the third area, uh, we have what we might consider the anthropological aspect, and I'm using that term just in the precise meaning of the word. I'm not referring to the uh, uh, contemporary uh, discipline of anthropology any more than I'm referring to the ancient, you know, theological division. I'm just saying anthropology is the science of the human. It's it's uh, the the sum total of human reasoning about what the human, in fact, is. <clears throat> so, up until the axial age. Uh, people were not thinking in any way about the idea uh, that everyone was equal. I mean, that idea just doesn't cross people's minds. Uh, you know, the king, uh, the high priest, uh, compared to, a, you know, a farmer or a shepherd, nobody is thinking uh, in, in an archaic society, in a cosmologically based society, that somehow all of these people are equal in some sense. When we finally get to the idea that everybody, uh, you know, at least has the potential um, or has some essential quality that, that gives them their value as a human being. Um, in the axial age, that's when that develops. Nowadays, even if you're not religious, um, you've got an idea of this. And that's the interesting thing about the axial age I was talking about uh, when we were talking about the uh, religious timeline. I, I uh, sort of opened up the conversation about the axial age. Um, Anyway, there's no uh, person in a lower rung of society that's thinking, well, God loves me just as much as the king, or, you know, uh, there's, 
you know, some other world I'm going to when I die where the king and I will, will be even, or, you know, there'll be some final judgment to, um, uh, you know, repay the king and repay me and will be repaid according to different uh, standards since, of course, the king had so many more opportunities to, you know, whatever. We, we think um, because of our concept of perfect justice, wherever we get that from, um, the whole idea of thinking about an afterlife, thinking about a final judgment, heaven and hell, anything like that, in a sense, it is our appeal to justice. We recognize the world is not just. And we recognize that, you know, if we're thinking about a God that is in control, that is, um, you know, obviously perfect uh, and all powerful in control and also uh, just and kind. There's no way you can explain what happens in the world as the will of God, because things just aren't fair. Bad things happen to good people. Good things happen to bad people. And you can't nobody's ever successfully constructed any kind of paradigm that you can project on any situation and uh, and find an answer that makes sense uh it just it hasn't happened and um this is the problem of uh, what we call theodicy um and theodicy actually is a fancy word that uh it kind of has to do with apologizing for god or or defending god because god who is supposed to be ultimately just and in control of everything uh you know certainly must need to be defended because the world uh, doesn't seem very just at all and so humans in searching for um uh, the assurance that some kind of perfect justice exists somewhere, and for that matter, perfect love, whatever, you know, a, an ideal situation without any of the suffering or limitations in this life, they imagine something beyond that. And um, here's where it gets really interesting. Nobody before the axial age would think, oh, when we get to heaven, you know, we'll all be the same or, you know, God loves us all the same. If you were a shepherd, it's because the gods didn't love you as much. And the reason you went to the priest uh, to bring your offering is so the rains would come and your crops would grow and your, uh, your cows would grow and have babies. And, you know, the nation next to us wouldn't attack us and kill us all. The benefits people were looking for by making supplication and sacrifice to the gods were the kind of benefits that would enable us to have a fulfilling and safe life uh, on this earth. Um, people were not thinking about, well, there's another reality where I have a different value, where I have some kind of eternal identity beyond my value in this life. And if you remember when uh, we were talking about uh, in the uh, Primal to Archaic video, um, we talked about individuation. And pre-axial age in archaic society, Human's value is determined by their vocation, by what they do. And again, there's no idea that everybody is equal, not in any sense whatsoever. I mean, you know, if you're the city manager, you know, you certainly um, are a better person, a more valued person, a more powerful person, a richer person uh, than the guy that's scooping up animal poop. You know, it's just the way it is. So what happens in the axial age is interesting. Since people start to think about the fact that there's an uh, reality beyond this world, um, then that must be where we've all come from, right? And um, if indeed I have a value or an identity beyond this world, then who I am in this world ultimately doesn't define me. Um, now, why would we come up with this idea? Again, looking for perfect justice, uh, things are not just in this world. And so the idea that every human being has some kind of value just because they are, uh, in fact, a human being, which is much the way we think today, um, is related to the fact that every person is seen to have some kind of origin or some kind of connection to this ultimate. And so common people now um, have some responsibility for their spiritual state. Because if they really have an identity, and, and in many religions it's called a soul or a spirit or you know whatever, not all religions, but if people really do have an identity beyond their identity in this world, or even if you don't believe in another world, but you believe that your identity in this world because you, um, you know, don't correctly perceive reality, your sense of who you are is completely wrong or completely illusory. Buddhism is a great example of that. Because of that, um, humans are trying to figure out who they are. And those who are most valued in this life are not going to have the biggest problem with this. It's easy to accept the fact that you're great. Um, but when you are disadvantaged, now you have some stimulus to think about why. 
And so what people come up with is the idea that who you are in this world is not who you really are. You have some other identity uh, that you're not uh, really seeing and perhaps will never know until the next life. But if you have an identity beyond your value, beyond your identity in life, which is based on, of course, your vocation, um, then where does that identity come from? Well, it certainly uh, must come from the ultimate, from uh, your origin, from your creator. And so that value must be something that, uh, uh, that God esteems uh, in terms of your worth or whatever. And so what this does, if every person, not just priests or whatever, but if laity have some kind of connection to the divine and they really want to uh, connect so that they can discover this, a sense of meaning and purpose and being more than who they are in this world, um, then it makes sense that they have some responsibility to cultivate this relationship uh, with the ultimate. And so in the axial age, what ends up happening is for the first time, lay people, that means people that aren't religious professionals, um, actually end up uh, involved in spiritual disciplines to try and have uh, the most uh, satisfying uh, fulfilling life that they can by pursuing some kind of an experienced or realized connection to the ultimate. So in the Axiom Age, for the first time, lay people actually want to read the scriptures. I mean, they actually want to understand uh, what pertains to them. Um, you know, before that, you know, when you were just going to the priest to offer a sacrifice for you or something like that, uh, you certainly uh, you know, didn't need to worry about any of that. The priest was the one that could communicate with God and the priest, uh, you know, uh, gave your offering and blessed you. And hopefully the God that respected the priest would respect the priest's blessing and you'd go home and, and, uh, and have a good life. After the axial age, obviously temple sacrifices are not done away with overnight. I mean, things change over centuries as we talked about before. But at this point, we have a whole new kind of religious uh, practice, if you will, among common people. What happens in the temples is not what happens in people's lives every day. And um, a couple places that we really see this happening and we see the changes are, as we talked about before when we looked at the timeline, the two religious traditions of the world religions today that were around before the Axial Age, and hopefully you still remember, those are Hinduism and Judaism. And because they were both around before the Axial Age, um, quite a while before the Axial Age really, we see them change radically during the Axial Age. We see ideas in the Axial Age born in these religions that never existed before. You can't find any record of people believing this before this. In Hinduism, we talked about this when we talked about different theisms. Monism is born in India. Um, very polytheistic, um, but we talked about monism. We talked about the difference uh, between monism and classical monotheism, whereas um, in classical monotheism, uh, people discard their belief in all of the other gods, and there's many different explanations as to why people could have believed in them. They could have been imaginary. They could have been rebellious spirits. You know, maybe they were all some manifestation of the same god or something, uh, which is kind of what happens in India in monism. And if you remember, we use two different terms, because in classical monotheism, there's one god and that's it. And if there's anything else that seems to be a god, there's some explanation as to why it's not. But in, uh, in Hinduism, um, in the Axial Age, they do not get rid of all the gods. What they do is they do conceive of a reality way beyond our comprehension, and a god way beyond our comprehension. Uh, in fact, a God beyond all duality, all sense of, uh, of distinction uh, or division. In fact, this God is everything and everything is a manifestation of this God called Brahman. Even all of the other thousands of gods are all personal manifestations of the God Brahman that is beyond our understanding. So again, in India, they don't throw away all the gods, um, but they do say that all of the gods are manifestations of the one ultimate. And so Hindu would claim to be monotheistic and, and don't argue with them. I mean, if all the gods are really the manifestations of the same God, you can call it that. But it's a different kind of monotheism than in the classical uh, three monotheistic religions today, because none of them would, would, would certainly say that, you know, um, Yahweh or Allah or something like that is represented by thousands of other gods that people can have relationships with. Uh, classical monotheism just does not believe or teach that kind of thing. Um, so that's why we gave a different distinction uh, to uh, the kind of axial age thinking that uh, begins 
uh, in India, and we talked about it, and we talked about Advaita Vedanta, and, and um, anyway, so I'm not going to go back through all that again, but in India, of course, polytheism turns into monism, as we talked about, and uh, in Judea, which was formerly um, uh, kind of in a middle phase between polytheism and monotheism, we call henotheism, which they actually uh, have some kind of rule. They're only supposed to worship their god, but they clearly think that other gods exist because they fall into idolatry, worshiping them all the time. Once we get to the Axial Age, and right in the middle of the Axial Age is when the Jews are coming back from captivity in Babylon. Uh, when they get back home, never again do they have a problem with idolatry. You never hear about it again. Because somehow they come back finally having accepted the idea that there is only one God in control of everything. And this is the birth of monotheism and Judaism. They were not monotheistic before that. Um, also, in Persia, um, a.k.a. Uh, Iran, um, we have a monotheistic religion born there uh, called Zoroastrianism, and we're going to talk a lot more about that uh, if you happen to be in the REL 2300 class when we get to um, the birth of monotheism and Judaism. We'll talk a lot more about what uh, possible effect uh, the religion of Zoroastrianism uh, in Persia, um, you know, how that might have affected uh, the Jews. Um, remember, it's the Persians that overcame uh, the Babylonians, and it was the great King Cyrus of Persia who uh, told the Jews they could go back and rebuild their land. So they love King Cyrus of Persia. But when the Persians do come and defeat the Babylonians, they do bring this new uh, monotheistic religion called Zoroastrianism with them. Now, it doesn't really exist today. There's a handful of people in a very small area uh, in the Punjab region. Um, but um, Zoroastrianism is not really a world religion anymore, so we don't really talk about it that much. Um, and also because uh, Zoroastrianism really departed from classical monotheism over the centuries and developed into something a little bit different. And um, I don't really take the time to talk about it too much because, again, it's just not considered a world religion. Um, most of you will never run into a Zoroastrian in your life. Um, if you want to research more, by all means, you know, send me an email and I will give you some ideas where you could research to learn a lot more about it if that happens to be something that is of interest to you. So, uh, again, monotheism born in Persia and Judaism, uh, Persia formerly polytheistic, Judaism formerly henotheistic, um, monism born in India, formerly polytheistic, um, as you know. Um, the soul, the human soul. In Hinduism, we know it's called Atman. Um, this, I, this is the identity that we talk about, that's the eternal identity. Uh, Buddhism rejects this idea, um, and we've gone through the Buddhism section of the course if you're an REL 2300 and why this is rejected in Buddhism. If you're an REL 2000, we're actually going to get to that um, uh, not too far into the future. I think it might be in the very next week because we're going to skip chapter 9. We're going to go from 8 to 10, and in 10 it does talk uh, about Tanavada Buddhism, so I will actually explain uh, some of the concepts uh, in the Four Noble Truths. I won't go quite as in-depth uh, as we do in REL 2300. Maybe you can take that next semester. Um, but we will talk about the basic teachings and why the idea of an eternal soul or an Atman is rejected in Buddhism. But there is some idea that you are much uh, different from what you think to be. And whatever your uh, personal uh, idea of yourself is, it is an illusion, and we get far too attached to this idea of who and what we are. So even Buddhism completely agrees with that, even though uh, they would not hang on to the idea of an eternal soul or something like that. So, uh, these are the kind of uh, axial age uh, ideas here um, that we want, uh, we want to focus on. Uh, one last thing in the anthropological, I mentioned that this is the time when common people, lay people, want to actually start reading the scriptures for themselves, want to develop some kind of a discipline where they themselves can uh, cultivate, um, realize some connection to the ultimate that might add meaning and purpose to their life. And because of this, there is a need for a new kind of religious professional. And again, in these two religions that exist before the Axial Age, Judaism and uh, Hinduism, uh, we see the birth of this new religious uh, professional, if you will. Uh, in India, as you know, these are called gurus. And you never want to confuse a guru with a priest. Priests are still in the temples offering sacrifices for whatever, but gurus are actually teaching uh, non-priestly people how to uh, have some experience, have some connection with the ultimate that will fulfill and add quality to your life. And in Judaism, the same kind of thing happens. In Judaism, the new 
uh, religious profession uh, is uh, the rabbinical tradition, the rabbis. And uh, much like the gurus, the rabbis are instructing lay people, non-religious professionals, in how to uh, walk with God, in how to please God, and how to develop a relationship with God. Um, so never confuse rabbis and priests uh, in Judea, and never confuse gurus and priests in India. Uh, very different functions there. Um, but again, um, gurus and, and, and rabbis are, are very, very similar uh, in their relationship to the priests. And uh, so this is something also that happens in the Axial Age. Anyway, if you have any other questions or uh, any other discussion, by all means, send me a message, email me, uh, whatever, and we can talk more about it. But again, uh, make sure you've read that document that I put online uh, just explaining the Axial Age. That was something that I wrote just to uh, kind of have something that I could uh, give students to think about before we talked about this. And in the document, it talks about... Um, uh, the Axial Age all over the world, the religions that are born in the Axial Age. Obviously, Hinduism is changing a lot, but also in India, we have the birth of uh, Buddhism and Jainism. In China, we have the birth of Taoism and Confucianism. Um, as we said, in, uh, in Persia and Judea, we have the birth of monotheism there and those religions. And uh, also, it mentioned uh, in the uh, notes there that in the Greek uh, empire, a very uh, advanced civilization in terms of the way they're thinking about ultimate reality, uh, we have the birth of some major philosophical schools uh, upon whose foundations we are still building today. The Axial Ages, when we see the birth of Stoicism, Platonism, Aristotelianism, Epicureanism. Now you might say to yourself, but, but, the, but those aren't religions, those are philosophies. Well, <laughs> There's a fine line between religion and philosophy. Uh, theology is basically philosophy that believes in God, if you want to ultra simplify. So a lot of these, now not Epicureanism, Epicureanism is you know, probably the farthest thing away from what you'd consider a religion perhaps, but Stoicism, Platonism, and Aristotelianism are, are, are all acknowledging uh, some ultimate uh, power that is in some sense perfect. And, um, and, and in some sense in control uh, of the world and, and of our lives. So why don't they call these religions instead of philosophies? The answer is actually very simple. And that is in uh, the society then, uh, classical Greek uh, religion is polytheistic. They have many, many gods. And um, obviously when we get to the Roman Empire, we see the same thing. There are many gods. And um, so any kind of a philosophy that minimizes the importance of these gods or in any way uh, would seem to be discouraging people from believing in them or worshiping them or whatever uh, would be seen as kind of anti-religious. And so when you look at Platonism, well, Socrates lost his life for, <laughs> among other things, suggesting that the gods you believe in don't sound much like gods at all. They sound about as arbitrary and capricious and incorruptible as human beings, you know. Um, so these really can't, uh, can't represent some kind of higher life form, really. Um, they sound more like humans with superpowers or something. And Socrates lost his life for that. But after that, the cat was out of the bag. So because they're really not acknowledging the pantheon of Greek gods, it's not really, they're not really considered religious, if you will. And um, let me give you another example of this. Um, in polytheistic societies, it is very much thought that the gods of the uh, nation protect the nation as long as they are worshipped correctly. So if at some time uh, the nation as a whole, um, or the largest part of the nation, uh, without rebuke from the leaders or whatever, uh, becomes uh, uninterested in the gods or ceases worshipping or uh, you know, ritual sacrifice or whatever, it is thought that the gods might be angry and might actually cause some kind of disaster to come upon the nation, such as uh, being overcome, which of course did happen to the, <laughs> the Roman Empire. Um, so going along with this, if you have other nations, for instance, that are part of your empire, um, they can't be making your gods mad. I mean, if you're going to be a Roman citizen, you have a responsibility um, to be reverent of the Roman gods. Because if the government allows uh, other vassal kingdoms or other ethnicities or religions or whatever that are going to disrespect um, you know, and devalue their gods, the gods might be very, very mad, whether they'd be madder at the... Uh, uh, 
you know, the, the vassal kingdoms or whatever that are not following suit, or whether they would actually be madder at the leaders of the empirical kingdom that are not uh, enforcing this, uh, who's to say? But it could turn out very badly. And so this is why people who challenge the religious systems, uh, like Socrates, or for that matter, you know, uh, the followers of Jesus Christ, um, often end up uh, being seen as like number one enemy of the state. Uh, you may know, um, and we'll talk about this later if you know Ariel 2300, but it isn't until the fourth century that Christianity becomes legal, and it isn't until the later fourth century that it becomes the official religion of the Roman Empire. It's ironic because the century right before this, uh, there's a horrible persecution. And um, so within like half a century, Christianity goes from the most persecuted religion in the entire Roman Empire to virtually controlling it. It's, it's amazing, it, the, the transition that, that happens. So I want to talk about before this, though. Uh, you know, the first couple centuries when Christianity is seen as some kind of a, a deviant religion or something. You may know that Christians were often put to death for their faith. What you may not know is that the charge is generally atheism. Isn't that interesting? Um, why atheism? You say Christians believe in God. Yeah, but they don't believe in a real God. I mean, there's no statue of this God. You know, there's, there's <laughs> people don't know what he looks like. You know, there's no temple built to this God where sacrifices are offered, you know, to the God of the Christians. Maybe the God of the Jews, but not the God of the Christians now. We're talking about Gentile Christians, not Jewish Christians now. They've changed the whole uh, doctrine of Jesus Christ a great deal. And so when they refuse to worship the gods of the Roman Empire, that's atheism. That's contra atheism. That's against theism. That's against uh, the worship of the Roman gods. So that's why the charge atheism uh, is actually the appropriate charge. So just a little bit to let you know how um, nations are thinking about things like this. And the whole reason I went into this is uh, why uh, Stoicism or Platonism or Aristotelianism would not be called a religion because they stand in contrast to the very well and very long established religion of the Greek Empire when they arise. Anyway, that's uh, about all I have. Uh, and again, if you have any other questions, please uh, give me a call. I will see you next time. Bye.